welcome to the Business Credit and Financing Show. Each week, we talk about the growth strategies that matter most to entrepreneurs. Listen in as we discuss the secrets to getting credit and money to start and grow your business. And enjoy as we talk with seasoned business owners, coaches, and industry leaders on a variety of topics from advertising and marketing to the nuts and bolts of running a highly successful business. And now, to introduce the host of our show, financial expert and award-winning author, Ty Crandall. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show today. I'm really glad everybody could join us. So today is going to be a really cool day. We're going to be talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart because we have a uh, special guest on with us. It's going to talk a little bit more about buying businesses, selling businesses. So this is going to be applicable to all of you in a couple different ways. For those of you that own businesses now, you're going to learn a lot about what you need to be doing to make sure that you have the best value when it goes time to sell. And you're going to meet somebody who might have an interest in buying your business when it comes time to sell. And if you're interested in getting into the business, you're going to learn a lot of inside information as well. So with us today is Carl Allen. Now, Carl's an entrepreneur, investor, and corporate deal maker who's worked on transactions worth over $50 billion, which includes over 250 acquisitions and sales, together with more than 100 capital fundraising projects. In a 24-year career, Carl's analyzed thousands of businesses, big and small, in 17 different countries and across nearly every business sector, including technology, pharmaceuticals, transport, and logistics engineering, manufacturing, aerospace, consumer goods and services, business services, retail, professional services, finance, packaging, and corporate clothing. Now, Carl has a solid reputation as an investor and corporate dealmaker, having worked for Bank of America, Hewlett Packard, Forrester, and Gartner. And he's advised some of the world's largest corporations on investments, acquisitions, disposals, and restructuring. Carl's also assisted hundreds of business owners in raising both equity and debt finance. Carl walks the talk, having acquired and sold numerous businesses for himself. Carl's one of the world's premier experts on buying and financing small business acquisitions and coaches more than 700 entrepreneurs all over the world to buy small businesses rather than starting one. So, Carl, heck of a resume, man. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Ty. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited you could be here. So, you know, how did you get into this? I mean, what first attracted you to the realm of, of buying and selling businesses? Yeah, so I learned the traditional way. So I graduated from college in 1992, and uh, I went straight into uh, investment banking. So I worked for Bank of America, was working on, you know, really, really large deals. I think my first deal was a $500 million sale of a business from Boeing to GE. So I kind of got into the game really early, spent a lot of time on Wall Street, you know, doing the hard yards, doing deals. And then I left, I went to business school and spent some time in private equity. And then my last real job was working at HP Hewlett Packard. So I went just at the end of Carly Fiorina's reign before Mark Hurt took over, and they gave me $25 billion to spend on software and services businesses. So I was flying all over the world, doing deals, some you know mega deals, billion dollar deals. And um, kind of, I had a really strange kind of thing happen to me in 2008. My wife was giving birth to my son. She was a couple of weeks before giving birth, and I was in Moscow, of all places, negotiating to buy a company and um, and Julia went into labor and I got the call. I had to literally dash to the airport. I ran out of the meeting room with my cell phone, my passport and my wallet. I left all my luggage. I left all my computers and books. I literally got to the airport, got on the plane. I walked into the hospital. Well, I ran into the hospital literally five minutes before my son came out. So I decided that, you know, I almost missed the birth of my son. I was going to retire from the corporate world. I was 38 at the time, and I was going to do my own deals. I was going to buy and sell my own businesses, which is what I've been doing. I'm still doing it today. In fact, just before joining you, I've just been working on an offer letter for a $7 million revenue engineering business in Texas that I'm buying. Uh, I'm buying that business without having to spend my own money, which is what I do. And a couple of years ago, I just got inundated with people wanting me to teach them my process. You know, how do you do what you do? Can you teach us? So I built a training program to coach and mentor entrepreneurs that they can take their own skills, their own passions, their own business experiences. And instead of working for somebody else or starting a new business from scratch, teaching them how to go and buy an existing business 
that someone else has built and doesn't want anymore and how to structure that deal without having to necessarily spend your own capital. So let's dive into that. I mean, what do you think from your perspective with your experience is the value of doing that, of buying a business rather than founding one? Yeah, so it's a really good question. And, and it's almost like I went and bought a cell phone from Apple just last week. And it's like, do I go and buy a cell phone that someone's built for me that works and I can just switch it on and, and operate it? Or, you know, would I go and buy all the different components and would I build that thing myself? It might be a different type of phone. So if you look at the statistics tied, they're astonishing. You, you know, there's there's almost 7 million people in North America every year go and start a new business because it's their passion. And they do that because they're frustrated working for somebody else. And out of those 7 million people, Michael Gerber, who's the author of The E-Myth, he, and this is his data, not mine, 96% of those startup seekers will fail within 10 years. 50% will fail just in the first year alone. So what I'd rather see happen is rather than go and reinvent the wheel and start a new business, bearing in mind if you start a new business from scratch, you've got no capital, you've got no employees, you've got no products or services, you've got no customers, you've got no credit, you've got no reputation. If you go and buy an existing business that someone's built but wants to sell and you can engineer that deal where you don't necessarily have to spend your own money to buy it, then you're buying a business that's already working. It's got customers. It's got everything that a startup you know, doesn't have. And, and another statistic that's really shocking is in North America today, there's over 2.4 million businesses available for sale with less than $10 million in annual revenues. And only one in 13 of those businesses will sell within the next 12 months. So you've got all these entrepreneurs starting new businesses that are going to fail because it's really, really hard. Yet you've got all these businesses that people want to sell but can't, I'm trying to connect the dots. That's my vision. That's kind of my dream. And that's, that's what I do what I do. Well, how do you uh, decide, you know, with all these businesses for sale, right, and all these different industries and sectors you've been across, how do you even get a start of, you know, what deciding on what kind of business you're supposed to buy? Yeah, that's a really good question. And what I do is I take people through what I call the dream deal specification. So the business that you should buy needs to tick three boxes. So box number one, it needs to be related to your experience. So, you know, if you've spent your career, let's say you're a manufacturing manager in GE, you wouldn't go and buy a retail store. Uh, you, you wouldn't go and buy a chemical processing business. You'd go buy an engineering company. You'd buy a company in a sector that you know and that you understand. The second thing that you would do is you want to buy a business that you're passionate about because once you've acquired the business, then, you know, as the business owner, you're going to want to grow that business. You're going to want to take it forward. So you want something that's going to get you out of bed every day and keep you passionate. And then the third thing is you want to buy a business where, you know, you've got a network that can assist you. So you, you've got people in the industry that you know you can leverage you know into that new business it might be customers might be suppliers might be advisors financiers all those different things and then the, the, the i suppose the fourth thing if we can add a fourth is you've also got to figure out you know do you want to be a business owner or a business owner investor versus kind of the, you know the general manager do you want to go into that business every day and operate it in which case it needs to be close to where you live. So location is important. Or do you want to be like an owner investor? So do you want to do the strategic work rather than the, the technical work, the tactical work? And, you know, some of my businesses, I own 17 different businesses all over the world. Some of my businesses, I only visit once a year. I've got managers in those businesses, you know, that are driving the results for me. And we're only collaborating via Skype or on the phone you know, maybe one hour per week. So those are the sorts of questions that one should ask themselves, you know, before they go in and start looking at deals, because otherwise you'd get lost in all the deals that are out there. So being able to focus and narrow down into sectors that you like and you love and, and you know, figure out, you know, what kind of role do you want to have in that business? Then originating deals becomes quite easy because 
you know, most of the deals that we originate, we, you know, we don't tend to go via business brokers. We we originate deals directly and we leverage a lot of, you know, social media techniques. But even people that want to get a fast start, want to go and look at business brokers, if you go onto bizbysell.com, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of deals that they've got listed. You can search on location, size, sector, all these different things. So it's become really, really easy, you know, to look for the types of businesses that are, are, are going to tickle your boxes. So do you think that there's industries to focus on or avoid entirely based on, you know, because I've heard that, you know, some industries have higher uh, multiples than other industries. Is that accurate? And is there industries to just completely avoid or ones that kind of do better than others? Yeah, so that's a really excellent question. And the answer to that is, yes, there are. So one industry that uh, is getting very high multiples is like the online space. So buying software as a service business or buying an Amazon drop ship type business, those sectors tend to have high multiples. You know, software companies, even though I own a couple of software companies, those multiples can be a lot higher and it's not necessarily the sector there's two things that drive valuation one is how fast the businesses are growing in that sector so if you think tech pharmaceutical you know amazon online type businesses they're they're all fast growing high margin so that's what drives valuation but the real driver of valuation is the seller it's seller psychology so what we focus on the types of deals that we're doing We're buying businesses from retiring baby boomers who can't sell their business. And what you find with those people, so our typical seller is a, you know, 50 to 65 year old person that uh, they could have started the business, you know, back in the 70s, or it could be a family business that they inherited, you know, from from their own parents. And for whatever reason, you know, they're, they're ready to let the business go. They either want to retire, they could be sick. Sadly, some of them could be, you know, really sick or, or dying in some cases, or they just run out of ideas, they're burnt out, they're frustrated, and they want to exit the business. And their motivation is not necessarily cash. They might want some cash, but they might be prepared to wait for that money over time, which is how we structure most of their deals. What they're most interested in is selling to somebody that they see as a safe pair of hands. So they don't want to necessarily sell it to a competitor that's on the other side of the country that's going to relocate it, rip it apart, destroy the legacy, the brand, the culture, let all the employees go, treat customers in a different way, even change the name above the door. I polled over 2,000 people a couple of years ago that had sold their businesses, and 79% of them, their primary factor in selling was not price. It was that safe, trusted pair of hands that could take the business on and take it to the next level. And and when you get into the psychology of some of these sellers, it's a lot more about it, it's like letting their child go to college. You know, they're giving up their baby that they've built and you know they want to see it thrive, you know, and be successful. You know, there are entrepreneurs, there are sellers, you know, that build businesses specifically to sell. You know, they want maximum value. And uh, there's a process to be able to do that. Sadly, most of the businesses that I look at, you know, they're not groomed and optimized and positioned, you know, to command a premium, you know, valuation in the market. Most of the deals that I see are from retirees. And, you know, there's 10,000 people retiring every day, according to the Wall Street Journal. And Forbes tell us that 19 percent of them own a small business. So we're going to have an epidemic especially in the U.S. within the next five to 10 years, because there's just not enough people out there that are trained and confident enough, you know, to want to go and buy a business. They'd rather go and start one and fail. And that's something that I definitely want to change. Well, how do you find these businesses? It doesn't sound like you're using business brokers. So we do use business brokers in a way, but what we do is we leverage a lot of free online databases. So we get a lot of information about companies that we're interested in so for example let's say you know you can use a database like hoovers you can say okay i want to buy a web design company within 50 miles of orlando and it will give you all the data on all those companies and then we write to them 
We write to them in a highly professional, highly confidential way, and we tailor those letters to tell those approaches specifically to the business and the owner. And we get between a one in three and one in four response rate. We're also leveraging a lot on social media, particularly with LinkedIn and Facebook groups. We're posting in forums, looking for deals, and we get a lot of deal flow that way as well. Well, that's interesting. So you're not even you know, doing, having people come and pitch to you or going out and finding a business to pursue, you're just kind of almost doing a blanket approach, finding the industry you want to buy in and then using this approach through LinkedIn and Facebook groups and, you know, just to go and find the best deal in that industry. Yeah. And what, what's interesting is that there's like seven or eight primary deal origination techniques that, that we utilize. And what we find is depending on you know, the members in my program, depending on, you know, their psychology, some of them, you know, they're working full time, so they want the desk based approach. Others have, you know, left a job, took some money, and and are looking at the next thing. They're happy to go to marketing events and meet people and, and do all those sorts of things. So, you know, there's lots and lots of different ways to originate deals. Uh, some people just go straight to brokers. Broker deals are harder, because it's the way the business broker industry works. Most business brokers, they'll convince the seller that, you know, they're going to get a crazy multiple of profit for the business. They'll charge them the big upfront listing fee, which they pocket. And that's why brokers will only sell one in 20 businesses. But if you go to business brokers and you ask them to give you their deals that have been listed for, say, 12 months or more, you've got that distressed seller psychology. So it's easy then to work with a broker to pick those deals up and they'll even help you do those deals because they want them off their books. Well, how do you quickly evaluate, you know, whether it's even worth, uh, you're even looking at a business worth buying or not? There has to be some basic things that you're looking at pretty quick. Yeah. So the first thing I always look at is seller psychology. You know, what's the motivation to sell? And you, you, you can have two businesses that could be identical businesses in terms of sector, revenues, and profits. One's owned by a 30-year-old entrepreneur that's crushing it, having a lot of fun, you know, in for the long haul. The other business is owned by a 62-year-old baby boomer that wants to retire. The pricing and the structure of those deals will be a million miles apart. So a lot of it comes down to seller psychology. So my first question with any business is, you know, why do they want to sell? And, you know, what do they want to do? So that's the first thing that I look at. And then what I'm also then looking for is I'm looking for businesses, and this is what I teach in my program, I'm looking for businesses that that have got assets because we want to use the assets in the business to generate the financing to be able to make the closing payment. And we're looking for businesses that have some degree of profit because we want to use that profit you know, to service the financing that we're using to buy the business. Or if we're not making a closing payment, and all the payments are going to be seller financed in the future, you know, we want to see some level of profitability, you know, to be able to make those payments. So we never do what I call distress deals. So we don't buy businesses that are really dying, because there's no point, it's easier to buy a good business, uh, because it's easier to finance it, you know, anybody can buy a distressed business for a dollar. But then you might have a really big uphill struggle to turn that business around and make it work. There are people that do that. There are people in my program that do that. Uh, that's not my wheelhouse. Um, I'd rather you know, get a good deal, get a good business, because I don't want to go in there and run it. I want the business to work without me being inside of it. And then you're looking for businesses that can be, you know, can weather recessions. So you're looking for businesses that can offer staples. You're looking for businesses that you know, are not specific to you know, boom cycles. And then you're looking for businesses that, you know, one of the key things I look at is, and it's the profile of an older business and an older business owner, is they don't do any marketing. All of their sales revenue come from repeat customers and word of mouth. You know, they don't use Facebook ads. They don't use LinkedIn. They don't use any kind of online advertising. So when I go into my businesses and I do some of that, you know, you can grow really, really quickly on top of the business that's already coming through the organization. Oh, that's interesting. What kind of assets? You mentioned assets to be able to obtain financing. We've talked about financing, so let's just dive into that. What kind of assets do you see that could be used as leverage or do you typically see that used as leverage to be able to obtain financing to purchase a business? 
Yeah, so so there's a couple of routes you can go on the financing aspect. You know, route one is you know the federal government in its generosity through the SBA, the Small Business Administration, they have a loan program called the 7A loan. So you need to have reasonable credit as an individual to be able to do that. So this is you borrowing the money. The SBA will kick in 75% of the purchase price of a business. And then if you convince the seller to take the other 25% in seller financing, which is not difficult, you know, you go to a broker site, They'll say, hey, 75% seller financing available. Well, great. So, you know, they're going to take 25. So uh, the SBA pays the 75. The seller takes the other 25 in the future. So it's a no cash down deal. The SBA will then want you to chip in, you know, 5 to 10% of the purchase price, you know, from your own funding. But because the deal doesn't need it, you can put it into the deal. And then as soon as you close, you can take it out. Or you can even use the cash in the business to make that happen. If you don't qualify for an SBA loan, you don't have the right credit, then what you do is you get the business to raise the finance itself using its own assets on its balance sheet. So we're looking for real estate. We're looking for fixed plants and equipment. But the number one asset that we always look for is trade receivables. They're fantastic. So you go to somebody like a Bibi USA or a GE Credit, and what they will do is they will finance up to 80% of the total receivables book inside of the business. And they'll give you a working capital facility to enable to continue to use that as you scale. So not only do you use it to buy the business, you also solve any cash flow problems that you have because you're getting paid on your invoices within 24 hours of you selling the product or the service. So that's the primary asset that we look for. So in terms of business to consumer, it's a lot harder to do that type of thing because Obviously, customers are paying at the point of purchase. So there aren't receivables, there aren't invoices, you know, kind of resident, you know, within the business or, or on the balance sheet. What we also can use inventory financing as well. We, we've done that in the past uh, with tech deals. You can also, you can borrow against the intellectual property if it's proven to be generating cash flow, but it's a lot harder to do that. So it's really, you know, kind of real estate, fixed assets and receivables that we utilize. If you're not going down So if you are going down the SBA route, then you as the buyer is the one acquiring the SBA loan. Is that right? And then how many of these type of loans can you have outstanding at any given time? So as an individual, you could it's unlimited. You can have as many you can have as many as you want. And what's interesting is you you've got to have the credit rating to be able to apply, but really the loans are judged on the ability of the business to service that debt and what the SBA does is they'll typically let you borrow the money and repay it over a 20-year period so if you want to be a business flipper so if you want to buy a business trade it for a year and then sell it an SBA loan doesn't really work because you're still going to have the bulk of that debt sat on the balance sheet when you sell and that's going to come off your your purchase price so if you're business flipping you want to be doing asset-based financing for SBA, you know, it's really more if you're in for the long haul, at least five years. So on the financial side, are you, you, I imagine you have to be looking at the financials. And if you are, it doesn't sound like that's a major driving factor. But what are the type of things in the financials that you're looking for to make a, a buying decision? Yeah. So one of the things – so you ideally, you want to be looking at the last three years of, of financial performance – So you're looking for trends, you you know, you're looking for revenue trends, you're looking for trends in margin, and and you're looking to see what the cash flow is, because, you know, there's an old saying, isn't there, you you know, revenue is vanity, earnings are sanity, cash in the bank is reality. So really, it's all about the cash flow, you can see a business that, you know, looks profitable, but if it's not managing its working capital sufficiently, then you know you want to be buying a business that's generating cash, and and the financial statements that uh, that you get from the seller. So when you go and see a business, you know you have your first meeting, you build some rapport, some trust, some credibility. You go under non-disclosure. They give you all the numbers, and then it's pretty easy, you know, just to go through it. You know, a lot of the people that come into my program, you know, they're not financially trained. It's obviously, easy for me because I'm a Wall Street guy. So I, I built tools and templates and models so they can literally get the financial accounts. I show them the eight numbers that they've got to extract. They plug them into the model. 20 seconds later, it tells them 
you know, the value of the business, where the financing is going to come from, how to structure the deal, and then what's the business's ability to be able to service that debt. That's the key. Because there's no point buying a business if the business can't repay the money. So figuring that out is, is really, really important. And in fact, you know, financiers wouldn't pledge the money into the deal if they didn't think that the deal could service itself as well. So those are all really important things to know. What about the owner? It sounds like, if I hear it right, that you almost are looking for the guy that's just like, I'm exhausted, I'm done, I went out, versus the young guy, the young buck that's come in and proven themselves and that, you know, is just passionate and excited what's going on. Or, or am I misunderstanding? I mean, what are you looking for in the owner to make that kind of decision? It's the former. So our model, it's the former. Now, uh, it's the distressed seller of a good business. It's the person that, you know, is ready to throw in the towel. And their only option, if they don't sell, is to basically close the business down. You know, a lot of people do. You know, if you can't sell your business and you can't take it anymore, they just close it down. They liquidate it and they destroy their legacy. They have to let their employees go. These are people that they've worked for them, you know, loyal people for a long time. And it, it breaks their heart you know, to kind of do that. So they, they'd rather not give the business away, but they'd rather do a friendly deal that, you know, is predominantly seller financed. That's better for them than to shut the business down. Because in some cases, if they close the business down, it's going to cost them money to do that. You know, they won't get the liquidation value on their assets. They'll have leases on the facility. They'll have bank loans and overdrafts. They'll have suppliers to pay. Some of them are probably their friends. So all the money they've saved for retirement, you know, they've got to get that out of the bank and start paying people down. Whereas in some cases, it's cheaper for them just to say, here you go, Ty, take the business on with the debt that's in it. It's a dollar transaction. I can retire with all my money left intact and go and live the rest of my life knowing that you're going to look after my business and, and treat it with respect. So that's the sort of person that, that we're targeting because – I'm coaching entrepreneurs to buy businesses, you know, spending as little of their own personal money as possible. And in a lot of cases, no money down from their own pockets. But as I always say, every business is for sale at a price. You know, if, if, if you've got $10 million burning a hole in your pocket, and you want to go and buy a company, you can buy a business from a 30 year old entrepreneur that's crushing it or wants to sell out but that all your money is going to be going to that person. So, you know, those aren't the sorts of deals that, that I do. I used to do those deals when I worked at HP and I had billions of dollars of their money to spend. Obviously, those were the deals that I were doing, but now that's not what we're doing. So then in this scenario, what's interesting is that you buy businesses all over the world, right? You own 17 businesses, but you're looking for the people, the founder, the one that built it, blood, sweat, tears, you know, they're gone now. That's what you're looking for. Well, then, who runs the business because you're not one to be there active day to day and whoever their next in line is might not have what you need to continue the growth of the business i think no you're absolutely right so one of the things i do in all of my deals bar two i find general managers that i can put in to operate those businesses for me most of the people in my program they will buy a business to go in and run it because it hits their skill set and their passion and they want to do it. But if you don't, you've either got to have the owner stay on, which is surprising to say. One of the guys in my program, Tyrone, he lives in LA. He's just bought a manufacturing business in New Jersey. The seller didn't want the hassle of owning the company, but he was happy to stay in and operate it. So he's done a deal where you know, he's continuing to go in every day, you know, he wants the income, but he doesn't want the responsibility of owning the business. So that's a win-win deal for everybody. That's quite rare, I have to say. In most cases, you either find somebody inside the business that can step up as a number two and, you know, operate the day-to-day. -day. So they're not doing the strategic stuff. They're not doing the financial stuff, but, you know, but they're keeping the, the train running on time. Um, if that doesn't happen, then, you know, you can leverage LinkedIn or your own personal network and go and find somebody that, that you can trust that can go in and can operate that business for you. And then what I always do is I gift them a sure. small piece of the equity. So I make them my partner. So it incentivizes them, you know, to drive the results because then, you know, that person's growing, you know, both of our wealth creation. That's interesting because if you don't have a, a big network and you don't have somebody you necessarily trust to take on that responsibility, Man, that's a huge risk to incur just to find somebody you don't even know to put in that position to run a business like that. I mean, do you do a lot of that or is almost all of what you do 
people within your network that you already have a relationship, trust is there, that you're finding to step in? Because I would think that's tough, right? I mean, like, you know a lot of people, but like you just described, you live in California, you don't know some dude in New Jersey that knows manufacturing that you just happen to know and trust, right? So I would think that would be difficult. Yeah, so there's a couple of points on that. So a really good question, actually. There's a couple of points on that. So throughout the process, because bearing in mind, it takes about 100 days from start to finish to do a deal. And part of that, you're going to be doing due diligence. So you're going to be spending time with the business. You're going to be meeting the employees. So you will build relationships and, you know, you will know if that person has got the skills and the trust level to be able to do that. But what a lot of people are doing, and I see this not just in my program, but in business generally, they're going in as like a two-man team. So you've got the kind of deal maker that's finding the deals, doing the negotiation, you know, sorting out the financing, getting the deal closed. And then they're partnering with like an operator that's then going to go in and actually, you know, operate that business and, and do the daily stuff that the business needs to do. And they're partnering and they're buying that business 50-50. So do you find then that the best course of action is to try to find somebody already in the business that knows the business, that's qualified and possibly has what's needed to step into that role? Do you oftentimes go there first? before you go? Yeah. So if you want to do deals on your own and you don't have the large network and you don't have a partner that can come in with you and do that operational stuff, then yeah, that would be one of the key points of your filtering, your deal filtering is to make sure that as you meet those, these businesses and you evaluate them, that, you know, there is a trusted person that's in there or what you can do is before originating any deals, you know, go and find somebody on LinkedIn, start to get to know them, and then, you know, figure out your plan together. Or, as I said before, you might have a partner already, and you want to go and do those deals, you know, 50-50 already. So there's there's multiple different ways of, of, of doing it. And as I said earlier, in some cases, not a lot, it's quite rare, you will find a business where, you know, the seller wants the job, but not the business ownership. And that's the perfect scenario. That really is. But, you know, it happens, you know, one in 20 yeah, especially cases, since I would you're say. you're looking for people necessarily kind of done with it to begin with. How do you best determine yeah. what to pay? Or how do you best determine the value? And then how do you best determine what you're willing to pay versus the value? Yeah, so it, it all comes down to negotiation, Ty. But one of the key things is, if you look at the data, so according to Biz Buy Sell, the average, so most businesses sell for a multiple of profit or free cash flow. So if you've got a business doing a million dollars in revenue and it's making a hundred grand in free cash flow, then you're, you're paying for the business as a multiple of the hundred grand. The average multiple last year for businesses, five million dollars in revenue and less in the States was 1.94 times. So people are paying on average around 2x. Some deals are higher, some deals are lower. You know, I've just done a deal where I paid less than one times. I've done deals in the past few years where I've paid six times because the business had the assets to raise the finance to make it work. So what's more important is not necessarily the value, it's the structure of the deal. You know, let, let's say you owned a business that, you know, was doing a million dollars and making a hundred grand in profit. And you said to me, you know, hey, I, I, I want a million dollars this business, I want 10 times, but I'm going to give you 20 years to pay me the money. And you only need to pay me anything if we go above one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in profit. You know, I'm going to take that deal all day long because there's no risk to me. If you said to me, you know, I, I, I want one hundred grand. I want one times, but I want it all now. And there's no financing in that deal at all. Then, you know, I'm not going to do that deal because I don't want to take that risk of having to dump 100 K of my own money in when, you know, the business might not work. So. The structure of the deal is more important than, than the valuation, but as an average, it's around two profit. Times. Right. Okay. And yeah, and then that, that makes a ton of sense. But I think as a seller, the concern is, is that if I step away from the business and sell it to you and I finance it, that you're going to run it into the ground and then I don't get the money that I finance. I would think that that's a concern that some of these sellers might have. Yeah, it is. And we handle that through the legal process. So one of the things that we do, we don't get that all the time. But when we do, I would say 50 50, you know, we get that concern. What we can do is we can allow the seller to have a clawback 
on the equity in the business. So let's say we were doing a deal. It was a million dollar deal, making a hundred grand. The seller wanted 200K. We paid a hundred down through financing the, the balance sheet or SBA, and we paid a hundred in the future. We'd own 50% right off the bat. We'd have to give the other 50% back if we didn't make those payments, because the more common question is, you know, not that you run the business in the ground, you know, you scale the business, you make all this extra cash flow, but you, for whatever reason, decide you're not going to give me the money and I've got to, you know, hire an attorney, I've got to litigate for that cash. So having that in the contract, that they're able to come back and and, and take their 50% shares, that's something that we do sometimes. What about if you're looking to buy a business, you know, what things should business owners be focused on to make their business worth more? Yeah. So this is kind of turning it on, on its head. So and this applies to a business owner already that wants to sell their business. And it also applies to somebody that wants to buy a business, but then wants to know what they're going to do with it, you know, once they own it. Because, you know, the point of buying a business is you, you grow it it makes more profit and then you sell it and you make money. So the, there's four things that you need to do, you know, with a business to sell it. So the first thing that you need to do, and this is the most important thing, is one of the things I see a lot with a lot of businesses that I see is that the business and the owner are one and the same. So the owner is the business. And in fact, the owner doesn't have a business. They have a job in their own business. So if they were to leave the business, the business wouldn't work. All the processes are in their head. All the sales relationships are in their head. And this is the owner that, you know, can never take vacation because the business wouldn't work, you know, can never get sick because the business wouldn't work. So the first thing that you need to do to sell a business at all is you've got to make it work without you. So it's got to be systematized and groomed so that if you're not in the business, then, you know, it still functions. You know, one one of my members of the program, he's bought four health clinics, all no cash down deals. And he's gone and he's systematized them and he's got them working perfectly without him. He got really sick last summer. He had to take six weeks out of the business. The business actually grew. It grew. It became more profitable without him being in it. So making the business work independently of you is really, you know, the most important thing. The second thing that you want to do is, you know, you want to grow the business. You know, a lot of businesses, especially the old businesses with with an older kind of generation owner, they tend to just let their business tick over year on year. It's word of mouth, repeat sales. You know, there's no real marketing. There's no focus. There's no business development process. You know, they don't understand any of that stuff. They don't want to. They don't leverage social media. They don't do any proper marketing. So it's getting all those things, you know, kind of figured out. The third thing there that you want to do is, you know, at least a year before you decide you want to sell the business is you want to get ready. So you want to get all your ducks in a row, you know, all your legal documents or your financial documents, you know, get everything really, you know, kind of organized. So if somebody comes in, you've got everything that they need. You know, I'm doing a deal right now where I've been waiting six weeks for some of the most basic financial information. You know, I'm at the point where I'm ready to throw in the towel because I can't wait any longer for this person because they don't have proper financial systems. They don't have all the data ready, you know, to give to a potential buyer. So that's really, really important. And then a, a kind of real, you know, kind of silver bullet play. And I do this in all my businesses is the only way that you're going to get a kind of premium multiple for your business is if you go and, you know, you've got to go and pick a fight with a competitor in the marketplace. So, you know, find out who your perfect buyer is. You know, why would they buy your business? Is it because of your customer base? Is it because of your IP? Is it because of your products and services or your systems or your team? You know, what is it about your business that's that's unique? What's the magic dust that you've got that others would cover? And then, you know, just go out and start making some noise in the market. Try and negotiate them and get into some of their customer relationships. And that's when they'll come and they'll take you out. You know, there's instances where, you know, Johnson & Johnson, although it was a big deal, they bought one of their small little competitors for almost 70 times profit, seven zero, because, you know, they were in the market, you know, causing some trouble and it's cheaper for them just to take them out than fight toe to toe with them in in guerrilla warfare. You know, Facebook, you know, paid a thousand times profit for WhatsApp 
but that was because you know they wanted to leverage you know the whatsapp community into what facebook does so so those are some of the things that you can do as, as a business owner but 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 generally if you're a baby boomer you're looking to come out of your business you probably don't want to be doing all that stuff but getting your business ready getting it organized separating yourself from it you know putting some growth into it you know those are all things that you know really everybody Carl, it's been be enlightening doing. today i mean this, you've shared some amazing insight there's a lot of people listening that are interested possibly in selling now or down the road and maybe have models that would work for you or there's also people that would like to learn more from you and your education platform about buying businesses where can all of our listeners go to get more sure. information yeah so the, the program's uh, called the business buying accelerator so it's businessbuyingaccelerator.com. What I could also do for you, Ty, you know, as a thank you for having me on the show and as adding real value to your community, I'll send you a special offer discount link that if you want to send that out to your community, you know, they can come in at, wow. a, at a 50% discount to the enrollment fees so i'd be more than happy that's extremely uh, generous and i appreciate that so everybody listening remember none of this means anything unless you take some kind of action so make sure you write this down business buying accelerator.com business buying accelerator.com my advice is to go check that out right now and also check out the show resources page and on the show resources page i'm going to have this link to this extremely generous offer that carl has where you can get in on his system for half off of what he normally charges to be able to get into the business of buying business Businesses. So I want to thank you very much, Carl, for spending time with us today. Thank you. I know you're a busy guy. And thank you all very much, very much for listening. Make sure you check out businessbuyingaccelerator.com and also check out our show resources page where you can grab this discount link that you are absolutely going to want to grab. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. You've been listening to the Business Credit and Financing Show with your host, Ty Crandall. Watch for our next episode to get even more insight on financing and growing your business. And don't forget to check us out online at creditsuite.com for even more business growth strategies.